Hello, everybody. My name is Sabana Devaraja, and I'm Managing Director here at Health Begins. Thank you for joining us on this webinar entitled From Public Charge to Voting, Five Ways Healthcare Leaders Can Tackle Structural Determinants of Health. Before we start, we would like you to know that this webinar will be recorded, and we will be sending this recording out to all registrants after the webinar. All participant lines are on mute. So if you have a question for us, you can enter it at any time in the question box that appears in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we've reserved time at the end of the webinar to answer all questions that come in through the question box, so please use that throughout the, the webinar and we'll be um, addressing them at the end. This presentation is scheduled to last for one hour. Um, I would like to move ahead to the learning objectives for this session, and so we will be um, Quickly, list, uh, by the end of this webinar, attendees will be able to list at least two challenges facing healthcare and community partners when it comes to addressing community level structural determinants of health. You will be able to identify at least three ways that Vanguard organizations are tackling these structural determinants, and then describe up to five strategies or resources um, that healthcare stakeholders like yourselves can use to transform these structural determinants in your own communities. And I would like to just present one last reminder, which is that you can submit your questions in the cute questions box. We'll answer your questions at the end of the webinar. And during and after today's webinar, please tweet at us. So here you will see all of the speakers' individual and organizational handles on the screen that you can use um, to, to follow this content today as well as ongoing. With that, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Rishi Manchanda, President and CEO of Health Begins, who will be leading us through this content and introducing our guest speakers. Rishi? Sadhana, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody um, who is joining us today. We have a lot of attendance already, and I'm sure uh, many more will, uh, will join us momentarily. Um, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to um, uh, both be part of this webinar today and to be uh, alongside Dave Chuxi and uh, Berenice Nunez Constant, um, both presenters from the nation's largest public health care system, New York City Health and Hospitals, and the nation's largest federally qualified health center or community health center, Ultimate Health Services. Um, that I'm particularly excited because of the topic of today's conversation. When we think through um, the work in a moment, uh, you'll, you'll see why I think um, I'm so excited and hopefully you will be as well. Uh, for those who don't know, Health Begins is an organization that uh, does work across the country with a whole variety of partners we're privileged to work with. Um, we design strategy, drive improvement, transform systems. And perhaps um, most importantly, um, when we uh, come together like this, we share conversations and pose key questions for the community. These webinars represent a way for us to be able to move the, the discourse forward as everybody is moving upstream. For today's conversation, we wanted to start up front by posing some questions that each of our presenters will certainly speak to that we ask each of you to consider as well. The first question is, what is the potential impact of the new proposed public charge rule? And what can healthcare institutions do to prepare and respond? The second question that we hope to address today is, what's a rationale for promoting voter and civic engagement? And what role can healthcare institutions play in this regard? And lastly, what are these examples and the stories that we'll hear from our presenters today tell us about the role of healthcare institutions in addressing structural determinants of health? Certainly not alone, and, uh, but certainly in partnership with a variety of partners in, in the social sector and in public health. So with these key questions for the day, let me um, go ahead and start to set the table a little bit um, by getting to know who's on the line first. So we'll start our first poll um, asking who's on the line. And so as we launch the first poll, Give us a sense of your organization or association. So the poll's open right now. The questions are, uh, are you a hospital, clinic, or healthcare delivery system, a health insurance plan, a community-based organization, or a social service organization, public health agency or department, or other? Let's give it a few more moments. Great, and let's go ahead and close the poll here and see who we have. It appears that we have about 29% of folks who are from the healthcare uh, delivery system side of things, both in hospitals or clinics, um, as well as uh, about 17% or so from community-based organizations, 
uh, another smattering of folks from public health, so thank you for joining as well, and then a whole 40%, four out of 10 of you who are other. So uh, please, please feel free to use the, um, the Q&A pane to uh, chat in um, what kind of organizations you belong to, especially if you're in the other category. Uh, we always like to get a good sense of the diversity of folks on the line, and again, today is no different. Um, really welcome the diversity of folks who are joining us today for this conversation. And with a sense now of who's on the line, let me set the table. Uh, many of you are familiar with this proverb, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man a fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Uh, it's an ancient proverb. Uh, it's one that in some ways sums up a lot of the work that um, we do in services and social services, healthcare services, uh, and in education in general. Um, but uh, we wanted to provoke today's conversation by thinking about um, what else might be missing from this proverb. What if the pond is polluted? Sure, you can teach a man a fish, but what if he's denied access to a fishing rod? And finally, why not teach a woman to fish? There are a whole variety of contextual, structural, systematic um, considerations uh, for every one of our um, efforts, whether it's providing services or educating individuals about ways to um, better manage their health, better um, help improve the health of communities. And this structural context is critically important, I think, in, um, in the work that we do and the work that certainly many of you are engaged in doing. It's time for us, in other words, to um, update the ancient proverb so we can start to understand the structural determinants of health. And for some of you, you may be familiar with Health Begins Upstream Communications Toolkit, where we started to provide a, a glossary of upstream terms and then map those terms uh, based on common use. You'll see at the top row here um, how many are these days describing individual level phenomenon, what we call the social needs or health related social needs. These are the individual effects of the causes and the interventions that we often apply to improve outcomes for these individual social needs are often micro level um, population health approaches. Then there's the next level of community level social determinants of health. So for example, if an individual has a social need like food insecurity in their household, a social determinant of health at the community level would be a food desert um, where there is a large prevalence of food insecure households. And these are the causes of poor health, the community level phenomenon that really shape the effects um, for individuals. And then there's the last level, the structural determinants of health. And for many in the health in the healthcare space, certainly, and I think many in this modern moment uh, who are considering addressing social determinants of health, this is something that I think many are aware of uh, broadly, but are not yet uh, describing acutely or specifically in the work that we're trying to do, these structural determinants of health. And that's where today's conversation is gonna really try to focus. These are the causes of the causes, um, the societal policy level, macroeconomic um, drivers that really shape uh, the distribution of social determinants of health at a community level, which then of course impact individual level phenomenon. So for example, why are there food deserts clustered in one particular community versus others? That's not an accident. That's due to policy choices over time, over generations. Um, redlining examples um, abound um, as a way of defining why certain communities experience more food deserts, for example, than others. So these are the causes of the causes. And that's where we wanna to focus today. This is not a new conversation. In fact, in 2010, when the World Health or excuse me, World Health Organization had defined um, the conceptual framework for action on social determinants of health uh, in a seminal work um, that was produced by the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health by the WHO, chaired by Michael Marmot. And there is a, a very clear distinction made between social determinants of health on the right, these community level and individual level circumstances, and then the structural determinants on the left. And so while the original had a little bit of a typo there in terms of structural determinants, you'll see uh, this is, again, something that's been talked about and um, described in, in, in uh, a lot of detail um, by the World Health Organization, by the CDC, and many others. The structural determinants are um, about the socioeconomic and political context uh, as well. So the structural determinants of health um, are, is a concept that, uh, for some of you, may be very familiar. Um, and for many, who, especially who come from the human rights or um, human development uh, community, uh, th this term of structural determinants is very closely related to a concept called structural violence. This concept was coined by Johann Galtung in the 1960s, and it's been developed by many others since then, including Paul Farmer, Nancy Shepherd Hughes, Amartya Sen, Thomas Bogey, and a variety of others. Um, thought leaders um, in the social determinants of health space, certainly, um, and of course in human development as well. And structural violence is a way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. It's not a passive way of describing structural determinants as if they just showed up overnight. Uh, structural violence really speaks to the, the fact that these are arrangements that were created um, or 
um, by choices that were made um, and the resulting influence on social structures, economic, political, legal, religious, cultural structures that stop individuals, groups, and societies from reaching their full potential. And that's why it's not surprising that structural violence, as, as well as the broader concept of structural determinants, is linked closely to social injustice and to understandings of human rights. One of the ways in which this has been described is that when actual rights or de facto rights in human rights law community, when those rights, the actual rights, fall short of de jure rights, in other words, the fundamental rights that are already enshrined in human rights law internationally and domestically, when de facto rights fall short of de jure rights, when actual rights fall short of promised rights or enshrined rights, then violence, as Johan Galtuk said, is present. So this concept is not new. It's been well articulated by many over the years. And uh, it's part of the reason that at Health Begins, we think a lot about what it means to move upstream along the continuum of improvement. Uh, to, to affect social drivers of health means not only moving upstream to address social needs, but also impacting community level determinants and finally, of course, because of the role of structural determinants, societal level causes of the causes as well. And so when we think about healthcare's role, um, as you'll hear about now from um, our next presenter, uh, it's important uh, and perhaps imperative to always work to understand, treat, reduce, and prevent structural harm. And to move upstream, um, for those who wonder sometimes what we mean by it, means to continuously improve social drivers at all these levels, individual, community, and structural determinants. So that's the table setting, um, but let's get to the main course. And our first uh, presenter right now um, is uh, gonna speak to that in a moment here. Uh, and to help him get a better sense of the context of where you're all coming from and for all of us, let's launch the second poll really briefly um, to get a sense of where your institution is driving improvement. Now that you have a good sense of the levels of improvement, social needs, social determinants, and structural determinants, give us a clear sense of where your current upstream strategy is focused. Check all that apply. We'll give it another five seconds here. A lot of great participation, so thank you. I'm gonna do a five count here. Five, four, three, two, and one. Let's close the poll and see where we're at. So 59% of folks clicked on individual social needs as a focus for your current upstream strategies where you're driving improvement or trying to. 81% of you uh, focused on community level social determinants of health. For example, food deserts, not necessarily only food insecurity. And about half, um, which is wonderful, 48% uh, um, are focusing on societal and or policy level structural determinants of health. So it's interesting to see this spread across all levels of change and it's wonderful in that way. So given that and given the engagement that, that we already have uh, clearly from all of you, um, let's turn this over to Dave, Dave Chokshi, uh, Chief Population Health Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals and someone who beyond his official title is uh, uh, someone who I consider personally a thought leader um, in this space. So Dave, uh, great privilege to have you with join us and um, the mic is yours. Uh, wonderful, thank you so much um, Rishi and uh, to the rest of the Health Begins team for, um, for organizing this important webinar. I feel a real sense of urgency about this topic. Um, so we can advance to the next slide. Uh, and I think it's appropriate to, um, to start on the slide that includes uh, my titles with, um, with a note of humility. Uh, and I feel, uh, you know, humility in two ways. Um, first, uh, because, uh, because the way that we are trying to take on um, social determinants of health uh, and social justice is very much a work in progress. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to sharing some of how we have uh, tried to approach it, um, but also uh, learning collectively uh, with all of you. Uh, and the second thing that I'll say just as the entry point is to, um, to recognize that so many people have been working uh, on these issues for uh, decades, if not longer. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, the, the other way that I feel a lot of humility in entering this conversation is to, uh, to acknowledge that all of that uh, has happened uh, over the last, you know, several uh, decades in our country and internationally. Um, and yet we have uh, so much further that we have to go. So next slide. Um, and, you know, my context is, um, is laid out here. Uh, I have the privilege of working at New York City Health and Hospitals, which is, uh, as um, Rishi mentioned, the largest public health care system in the country. We take care of over um, 1.2 million patients, about a quarter of whom 
are uninsured. Uh, we've, it's a large uh, footprint with respect to our system. You can see our, our hospitals, our community-based points of care, nursing homes. Uh, we provide almost half of the behavioral health services um, for the city uh, and also take care of, of a number of people who uh, are or have been uh, justice involved as well. Um, we have a very ethnically and culturally diverse patient population, uh, including uh, many immigrants. Uh, and just to put a little bit more of a face on that, in, in any um, clinic session that, uh, that I have where I'm practicing primary care, uh, about a half to two thirds of my patients won't speak English as their first language. Um, and, and also to, to uh, convey a bit of the, you know, the human element to uh, the people that we try to serve um, you see these last um, bullet points, which point out that we uh, we take care of uh, tens of thousands of patients who are homeless, uh, thousands of patients who would be considered um, high need by uh, by any definition that you would use with respect to need. Um, and you know, one way in which uh, that it really comes to the fore is to think about the fact that for hundreds of the patients who cross our threshold, they actually spend more days inside of the hospital, um, you know, inside of, of an institution that none of us uh, wish for ourselves or our family members. Um, it, you know, they spend more days in those places than out of them in the past year. Uh, so we really try to keep, um, you know, this uh, front of mind with respect to what we are responsible for, uh, both in terms of healthcare, but also in terms of fostering uh, health for the people that we serve. Next slide. Um, and, you know, one way that we have started to think about uh, organizing uh, the social determinants of health um, and moving toward uh, social justice uh, is laid out here. Um, and, you know, the, the title of this slide is, of course, uh, adapted from a famous Martin Luther King Jr. quote. Um, but I think it uh, ties back to, you know, what I was trying to convey about uh, entering into this conversation with humility. Um, the arc of the social determinants universe is long, uh, but it bends towards social justice, uh, but only if we, you know, uh, take it upon ourselves to, um, to try to move the conversation along the trajectory that is described here. Um, and I think, you know, what I would say about the trajectory as it's laid out is, for me, it kind of answers, or at least starts to answer uh, some of the so what Question. So if we accept, you know, the frameworks that um, that Rishi went through so eloquently around uh, social determinants as they've been laid out by the World Health Organization uh, and uh, as Health Begins has organized in its um, terminology around upstreamism, uh, you know, what should we do about it? Uh, and the way that we have started to think about it is to um, to make sure that we are allocating our resources uh, along various points of this trajectory. So first, uh, it is important to address individual social needs um, like food insecurity uh, because they have an urgency. People are presenting to our clinics uh, and to our hospitals um, with, uh, with those you know, specific needs that drive uh, illness uh, and that drive inequity in our society as well. So one of the ways that we can start to address them is by making sure that we uh, are delivering or partnering with those who are delivering social services. Um, you know, for example, uh, housing providers. Um, but that we're also linking all of these things together in a whole person framework, uh, which is the social care point of this trajectory. And one of the things that I always, you know, point out is that uh, when when uh, we talk about social determinants of health with social workers. Their response is often, well, welcome to, you know, what we've been doing for, uh, for, for um, our entire careers. Uh, but I think what um, it lays bare is that we have to be able to knit together uh, all of the different point solutions into uh, an approach that actually respects the fundamental dignity and humanity of uh, people who don't come, you know, parceled out in different categories. Uh, and then ultimately, this has to tie to um, structural change, uh, which is represented by the social justice point here. Um, along the bottom, uh, I'll just say briefly, is another way to think about a trajectory like this, which uh, for people who have been involved with the accountable um, uh, health communities uh, work from the CMS Innovation Center, this should look somewhat familiar in moving from awareness to assistance to alignment 
uh, and uh, we added you know this fourth piece of it, uh, which is to make sure that we are committed to advocacy um, you know where there are political choices involved. Next slide. Um, and so you, taking you know that uh, backdrop, we have uh, tried to get very hard nosed and concrete about uh, addressing social determinants of health um, within our large public system. Uh, and we started um, with this focus on four uh, key domains, which are laid out here, housing, food, legal services, and income support, um, and starting to think about how we might address, uh, address each of those uh, domains at both the individual and the structural level. So I'll just you know, call out a couple of examples here. Um, you know, at the individual level, uh, thinking about eviction prevention services uh, is, uh, is fundamentally important for people who may be housing unstable. Um, but ultimately, we also need to think about the structural factors that make it so that we have uh, you know, tens of thousands of people who are homeless in the city that we live in um, and making sure that we are focusing on uh, trying to partner with others to address housing supply uh, as well. Um, similarly, you know, medical legal partnership represents a way to address individual social needs, um, and it ties into uh, what we have to do um, to, uh, to address um, the threats, particularly to our immigrant patients, uh, with respect to public charge. So we wanted to share, you know, this um, in particular, and I want to give um, credit to Kapna Bandarkar, uh, who was our social determinants lead, who's really laid out, you know, much of this approach. Uh, for health and hospitals as we think about how we get very um, tangible with respect to, um, to addressing social needs as well as structural determinants. Next slide. So speaking a bit more specifically uh, about public charge, um, you know, I'll put on my uh, primary care doctor hat to say that um, one of the ways to think about this is very similar to how I would think about taking care of a patient with diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, which is you start with individual needs. What is it that people are actually uh, coming, uh, you know, to our points of care um, where we should address, uh, you know, needs as they present themselves? So uh, we focused a lot on patient awareness and educating our staff to understand uh, the ramifications of the public charge rule. Um, let me back up just a second to make sure that we're all reading off of the same um, sheet of paper here. Uh, in uh, pointing out that public charge uh, is really, um, you know, a rule that is promulgated at the federal level by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which makes it um, much more difficult for uh, immigrants um, who are seeking lawful permanent residence in the United States um, to, uh, to use public benefits like uh, food stamps, the SNAP program, or like Medicaid or housing assistance. Um, and so what we're seeing is a, a chilling effect um, from immigrants who are not taking advantage of those services and in many cases, uh, illness and uh, other you know, types of suffering resulting from, uh, from that disenrollment, um, as well as uh, you know, people who are wondering how this, this will affect um, themselves and their families. So we have to address those individual needs as they present themselves, uh, but also um, again, with humility, recognize that there are many things that um, we may not be able to directly address uh, without additional uh, legal expertise. Uh, and so um, thanks to a, a wonderful longstanding partnership that we have with the New York Legal Assistance Group uh, here in the city, we also have a medical legal partnership so that we can make referrals when a higher level of expertise is needed in the same way that I, for a patient with refractory High blood pressure may um, consult with a cardiologist. Um, and even beyond that, we're, um, we're engaging in advocacy. So one specific way is by joining a lawsuit with the city of New York and the attorney general of New York State um, to uh, raise our voices about how harmful this will be uh, for our patients. Um, and everyone from our uh, CEO uh, on down um, is encouraged to speak out, um, particularly as clinicians, you know, seeing the harmful effects of the uh, of the policy as it starts to hit the ground. The last point that I want to make here is just the importance of of relationships. You know, in the same way that relationships are fundamental to delivering good primary care or really any health care, um, the fact that we had this long-standing partnership with uh, the New York Legal Assistance Group was what enabled us to be able to respond to public charge 
um, as we've been able to, and to monitor the situation, uh, you know, so that um, so that we're aware of uh, what's actually happening on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week, um, basis. Uh, and so, um, if you advance to the next slide, uh, just to round out that point, um, you know, these are uh, things that we have been able to draw upon uh, because we have already, you know, co-located um, attorneys at many of our points of care. Uh, so that um, you know we're able to uh, to address immigration legal issues as they arise, um, but also other areas where um, legal issues are often you know a more fundamental social determinant of health uh, compared to um, to housing or to income support. Uh, and so the medical legal partnership is a way to surface um, how those issues arise at an individual level and almost sublimate them into understanding what needs to happen at a policy and an advocacy level. Uh, so let me um, leave it there. I'm looking forward to the um, discussion, uh, but for now I will pass the baton to uh, our next presenter, uh, Berenice Nunez-Constant um, at Ultimed. Over to you, Berenice. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Choksi. So I'm excited to be on today to talk a, a bit about um, our role in, in really leveraging um, our role as the largest federally qualified health center in the nation and leading the, the way, um, at least here in Southern California and hopefully nationally, on how organizations of our size um, and uh, breadth and, and impact can really um, utilize our resources that we have our, at hand and our infrastructure um, to really um, build power in our communities. But um, again, um, thank you very much. And so we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. I'm very proud to share that because like many organizations uh, probably on the phone with us today, um, our organization has been rooted in social justice since the very beginning. We really believe strongly and wholeheartedly. And even as we have continued to grow, um, from one um, free clinic in East Los Angeles um, that opened because we realized that there was a need in that area, uh, which is a predominantly Latino community, um, and pregnant women did not have access to the services that they need, needed. And so we opened our clinics and we were handing out tickets. Folks would line up every single day and we were handing out tickets uh, for folks to get the services that they needed. Um, and those that did not get services, you know, just did not did not get a ticket, did not get services. And so we realized from the beginning that it, it was really our responsibility to um, ensure that folks had access to the services that they needed. And we were really aware of the health disparities that our communities uh, were experiencing and really sought to address these in, in various ways. Um, which included civic participation and voting since the very beginning. Um, our roots um, are also, um, uh, we're kind of dug very deep by groups like the Brown Berets. And so for us, um, we really, really believe that civic engagement is a social determinant of health. So when you look at communities that are have been disenfranchised for many, many years um, and are not civically engaged, you the, the equation just completely aligns. There's lack of resources, education is maybe lower quality, um, there's scarce uh, food, and the, the whole social determinants of health equation comes together. And so um, we, as the largest uh, federally qualified health center, have really set out to demonstrate um, and really build a new and innovative model um, that includes civic engagement, not only in our um, in the way that we do business, but also in our mo model of care. Next slide, please. So, so we know that civic participation is intri intrinsically tied to health and the quality of life for our communities. We know that voting is directly correlated to, to better health, right? If, if folks are educated on the issues that are impacting them, they can then use their vote to really elect folks that, you know, represent the, the, the priorities and, and things that are important to them. And therefore, um, we also know that amongst the most trusted messengers, doctors and nurses are at the top in, in our communities, particularly in communities of color. So 
Altamed said, hey, you know, we are uh, by default as a federally qualified health center, we are in medically underserved areas in Southern California. Um, we're also a healthcare provider, which makes us one of the most trusted messengers in our community. So how can we then leverage that role as a trusted messenger to really reach the people that are coming through our doors every single day that happen to be, you know, folks who are low propensity uh, voters, folks who are experiencing experiencing social determinants of health and uh, issues with equity at the highest levels. And so we embarked, uh, next slide please, we embarked uh, on that exact issue to try to figure out how we could build capacity within our communities to really respond to not only the healthcare issues, but to really build and sustain healthier communities. And for us, we believe that the community clinic is perfectly situated within our communities to really be a central hub for civic engagement. And we, be, we began to build a, a blueprint. Um, so there on the left, uh, you'll see where the clinic-based mobilization blueprint, the, there's a circle in the middle. And so around that, we began to build our blueprint to include using our clinic infrastructure as voter engagement hubs, right? We're getting the lowest propensity voters coming through our doors. They trust us. So let's start to educate them about the issues that are impacting the, the, the societal structures that are in place in their communities that are potentially creating barriers for them to services. Um, we also said, let's begin to strategically leverage our community partners. So just because we're the largest doesn't mean that we come into a community and say, hey, let us do it for you. We know best. We come into communities, for example, in Southeast Los Angeles, where we have one of our biggest footprints, it, all, it also is one of the hardest to reach communities in the country. And then we say, what are the group, who are the groups that have been in, in this community alongside ourselves that are really doing the most important work? And we begin to engage in conversations and coalitions so that we can then define not only what the, the roles and responsibilities are going to be, but the ultimate goals for the community that are coming from the community. And then we address barriers to mobilization by doing policy and regulatory advocacy, but also just general civic engagement, um, outreach and engagement to our patients and our employees, because we, we have to activate our employee base because community health centers hire from the communities in which we serve, and therefore our employees are a direct reflection of our community. So they are part of our mobilization effort. And then we use all of this, these, five touch, um, these five touches to really reach and engage our community and really focus on low propensity voters. That makes our outreach a lot different because we know campaigns focus on the exact opposite. Folks who are high propensity voters and that are gonna come out to vote anyway. And so our hope is that by utilizing this model, we can really transform communities to really build community power. Next slide, please. So I want to share exactly what we have been up to for the last, not only for the last 50 years, but more formally since last year. Um, we know that we've been doing the social justice work throughout our history, but last year we decided to really formalize our civic engagement function here at Altamed and really um, begin to, began to focus on, large, on launching large-scale, uh, nonpartisan get-out-the-vote campaigns targeting low-propensity Latino voters in Southern California. We focused on Latino voters because here in the state of California, it happens to be you know, the, one of the largest groups, but in our service area, it's absolutely the largest group. We service about 86% Latino patients or Latinx patients. Um, and, and we found that our efforts led us to great success. Our program really aims to inform and empower and really mobilize our patients and employees um, to really educate them on how, the power of their vote. And then ultimately, um, we want to transform our beneficiaries and our employees into active constituents um, and then ultimately healthcare community advocates. So the next three slides, um, can you go to the next slide, please? Our, our aim to just really demonstrate our service area and who is within it. So here are our 50 clinic sites in Southern California. Next slide. 
within our service area, there are very high concentration of low propensity voters, as I shared with you previously. Next slide. And by default, as we look towards the 2020 census, in our service area uh, is overlaid with the hardest to count census tracts. And so these folks are coming through our doors every single day. And we're a medical provider. We've been in the community for 50 years, and they trust us. So we really feel like it is our responsibility to, to begin to engage them in, in, in civic participation. Next slide. So let me share with you what our five touch blueprint looks like and what some of our outcomes were for the last year of our campaign. So I'll start off with our 2018 midterm election. So we focused our efforts in Los Angeles County um, and Orange County, by the way, but these are numbers from Los Angeles County. And for the 2018 midterm, um, our outcome showed 12 percentage point increase um, in the turnout rate compared to the 2014 race. And this corresponded with a 98% increase in actual folks coming out um, and voting. And these are folks that we worked with and we engaged in. Overall, ultimate reach, uh, our reach represented 138% growth over the 2014 baseline. And these are not just our numbers. Uh, we have been working with UCLA and the University of Riverside to really measure our campaign and our campaign outcomes um, because we really are trying to build a, a five-touch model uh, that it can serve as a best practice for all for other community health centers. Last year, we made um, we attempted over 1.1 million contacts and successfully reached 30,000 low propensity Latino voters um, in our service area, and this um, resulted in a change in turnout of 8.3 uh, percent um, point uh, percentage point, which UCLA and UC Riverside said that, you know, we've not seen these numbers, so just please continue to do the work that you are doing because it really is amazing. But I think it really just speaks to the fact that, you know, we are a trusted messenger in the community and we're not, we're, and we're actually like brick and mortar and we are, we have infrastructure in these communities. And so they, they trust us and they can come and find us if they're questioning anything that we're sharing with them. It also means that, you know, we are going and we're knocking on doors and we're coming to the doors with an ultimate hat and an ultimate t-shirt and our open rate for that door it's like oh you're here for my doctor's office people feel very comfortable and they open their door and then we can really engage them in that conversation um, next slide please so i wanted to kind of just drill down one level these are some of our numbers from our primary election campaign so we also had a campaign for the primary election and i want to focus your attention to the first row there, just as an example. So Southgate, the city of Southgate is one of the highest, hardest to reach and hardest to count communities in the country. Um, we had identified 1,178 registered voters. And in 2014, 71 of those voters um, voted, registered voters and eligible voters actually made it to the polls and voted to cast a ballot. In 2018, when we came in and we worked the area, we were able to have 378 voters come out and confirm that they made it to the ballot box and voted to cast their ballot. Um, that, that represented a change of an increase of 432%, which is amazing, right? And I want to take a moment just to say that that is amazing. And these are some of our highest performing precincts. So you can see, you know, we made differences from 232% up to 432% in some of these hardest to reach and hardest um, low propensity voter district. But in that first row, there's, there's still 800 voters that did not vote. And so for us, this is just a huge opportunity and we are continuing to do this work as we look for towards the 2020 census, but also the 2020 presidential election. Next slide. So as I alluded to just just a moment ago, um, we will be expanding our program to really include um, outreach for the 2020 um, election, but also the upcoming 2020 census. We're leveraging our community clinics infrastructures to really um, help folks feel comfortable. Um, number one, meet them where they are, right, and educate them on the census, especially 
given um, the chilling effect that is going on in our communities right now with regulations like public charge, but also ice rates that we've seen in the area and other things. And so that's making immigrant communities, uh, Latinx communities, very fearful of uh, engaging and responding to the census. So we're hoping that our our relationship with them as a trusted community messenger can help them, um, you know, participate and become civically engaged. So when folks start receiving their, their census questionnaires and we call to confirm their appointments, hey, Mrs. Rodriguez, uh, your appointment is tomorrow at 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock. I shouldn't make a doctor work during this lunch hour. At 11 o'clock, um, you know, please bring your census questionnaire. We'll have someone here. We have a census kiosk in our lobby, and we'll have someone here that can assist you with filling out the census. And so, and then we'll also embark in a, a 2020 uh, presidential uh, nonpartisan get out the vote campaign and really leveraging our, our five touch model here. And, and our goal is to develop a best practice model and a toolkit that we, that can be replicated and we're going to be sharing it with our statewide trade association. We also have our national uh, association of community health centers. Community health centers are located in medically underserved areas and by default uh, are highly likely to serve a low propensity uh, voters or folks who are uh, not as civically engaged. And, and we hope to, that this will become a best practice model going forward um, with measurable uh, uh, outcomes and data to support it. Um, next slide. And with that, um, it is my pleasure to turn the presentation back over to Dr. Rishi Manchanda. Berenice, thank you so much. And um, uh, just a quick housekeeping check. I know that there was some background noise coming through. So as folks, if you could um, verify uh, both on the organizer side as well as anybody else who's on the line, just go ahead and mute yourself um, and um, see if you can adjust your background settings and um, that'd be helpful. Uh, but Berenice, thank you so much. Dave, thank you so much for the presentations right now. We're gonna start a wireside chat conversation um, in a moment here. And uh, to do that, we really want to start to en engage all of you. For all of the 177 folks who are currently uh, tuned in, let's uh, let's ask you to um, give us a sense of um, not just um, public charge, if that's something that is top of mind, please in enter that. Um, if voting barriers are another structural harm that you're focusing on, uh, uh, as Berenice described, then please mention that. But if there are other pressing structural harms or structural determinants of health that healthcare institutions should help to reduce or prevent, go ahead and um, use the Q&A pane to submit your short answers, one word or one phrase at this moment now. We'll, and, and don't worry about um, a time clock on that, just keep on sending those in as we go ahead and launch the Wireside Chat. What we'll do in a few moments as we, after um, a certain section of the Wireside Chat with Dave and Berenice is to present a word cloud of all your answers so we can get a sense of the types of structural determinants, not just social determinants or social needs, but structural determinants of health that uh, are pressing for you and your, your patients and your communities. Um, with that, um, again, just a quick request to um, mute or unmute. Berenice, I'm wondering if, um, because I heard you mute and unmute there, I'm wondering if um, if, uh, if you want to readjust whether uh, your handset it may be coming from your side. Okay, uh, let me That's let me that much better there. Yeah, is that whatever better? You, okay. Whatever you just did is much better. Yeah, perfect. Thank perfect. you so much okay, for doing Sorry that. about that. Thank no you. worries. So um, for Berenice and for Dave, um, let's start out with um, something that touches on what each of you directly spoke to um, in terms of uh, current structural pressing harms, public charge, voting barriers, and ask you to um, just describe some concrete actions that healthcare institutions can take, um, kind of modeling what you've been doing as well as what you've learned to address public charge and voting barriers. And again, let's try that mute unmute uh, function there. I'm not sure, uh, Berenice, if it was on your side of Dave, but uh, maybe I'll turn it over to Dave first to take a pass at concrete actions, and then we can turn it, Berenice, to you. I'm sure. I'm happy to start. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the starting point for, um, you know, specific concrete actions on public charge is really to, um, to arm oneself with, um, with information uh, and understand, you know, how things are evolving um, day to day uh, so that, you know, if you are in a direct service setting, uh, you're able to, you know, provide uh, updated information to the people that you're serving um, and also monitoring uh, advocacy opportunities. Uh, and so the one, you know, resource that I would just highlight, uh, and I'm not sure if there's anyone who represents this coalition on the webinar, but um, Protecting Immigrant Families, uh, which is uh, a group that is being co-organized by the National Immigration Law Center, 
uh, and CLAS, which is the Center for Law and Social Policy. Um, they're really, uh, you know, helping spearhead uh, how to keep people informed and how to get uh, people active. Uh, and so the website, um, you know, that I, would, that I would share with everyone is protectingimmigrantfamilies.org uh, so that you can think about um, how to get involved and how to um, tailor communication yep. Yep. specifically to the people that you're serving. Dave, thank you so much for that. And Bernice, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Yeah, um, Whatever, your audio is coming through clearly now. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So, so my response is is similar to to Dr. Uh, Choksi, but you know we have been really sure really focused I'm on that. Doctor, that um, Gusto would approve, but I just I don't think that you need to worry about when somebody calls you for an event that's in two days. That's just. I'm so sorry. Funny. Somebody somebody's line is um, unmuted. I'm not sure <laughs> whose that is. Yeah. I'm sorry, Bernie. Said, yeah, sorry about that. Please continue. Oh yeah, that's okay. I'll continue. Um, so we've been, you know, really heavily focused on educating our patients because since that rule, the public charge rule came out, we started having patients come through the door and saying, you know, doctor, this is going to be my last visit. I won't be coming back. Oh. And so we've been really actively engaged in just making sure that they're getting the information that they need. Um, I really like the idea of the medical legal uh, partnership that Dr. Uh, Choksi presented. Uh, we are def definitely also exploring that. But I think really ultimately the role is for organizations that are in this space serving this patient, these patients to really raise their voice and get involved. Uh, we're part of the Protecting Immigrant uh, Rights Coalition as well. And so I would invite other folks to also join that as well so that we can make sure that messaging is aligned and that we have uh, collective power. Have you? Um, Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. So one of the things that um, that clearly you guys spoke about, in addition to public charge and uh, voting barriers, was the broader issue of structural determinants of health and the way um, each of you spoke to directly the the fact that um, the social justice mission that undergirds each of your institutions right now kind of compels you to address not just needs for individuals and and community level social determinants, but also these broader structural issues. Uh, compels me to um, ask you to you know, draw on your experiences, um, challenges, um, opportunities, insights you've had in terms of relationships, and wonder if you could give us your sense about uh, the role that healthcare institutions can can take, especially as they're considering ways to get a bit more active. Uh, many, I'm sure, um, of healthcare institutions and many um, public health and social sector partners who are in the line right now have the same sense of mission. Um, but I'm wondering, and I'm sure they each have uh, concrete ideas about ways they uh, engage structural determinants. What are your, some, some of your thoughts? Um, Berenice, do you want to go first in terms of just um, taking a pass at common challenges and what insights you've had in terms of kind of kinds of relationships? And we'll turn it over to Dave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the, the main challenges is, is in order for us to do this work, right, we need to have the organizational commitment from the top down or whether you're more of a, a flat organization, that commitment needs to be there. And so we've had that thankfully have been able to, that's in our roots, and we've been able to secure that really early on in this work as we really formalized it as of last year. And um, with that comes, you know, a sponsor that can really help us drive our work through and, and really embed it within um, the operations in our company and, and leaders that can help us look at our model of care and say civic engagement is important and this is how we're going to mobilize our doctors and our providers to really talk about these issues and really respond and address them. Um, but in terms of really kind of um, concrete examples, one way to start is if we started this work, and I know many of you probably do this already, but I will share anyway. Voter registration drives are really important. Today is National Voter Registration Day, and so there are a lot of efforts that are going on today. Um, we do a lot of voter education efforts so every election even for some of the local ones we we as a nonprofit can do um, education mm -hmm. on propositions and measures and so we produce voter guides for our patients to to help inform um, their to just help educate them on on the various measures and propositions for upcoming elections mm -hmm. we also do things like town halls when the public charge proposed rule uh, was released, we had a, a town hall in East Los Angeles, and we had a really 
awesome turnout. But what I'm the most proud of is the, how, the intimate space we were able to create and people were really being very vulnerable. And I think that speaks to, again, our role as a trusted community voice uh, where folks really feel safe to really bring up those types of questions. And we do things like citizenship and naturalization um, workshops and assistance. And mm-hmm. and I will also invite all of you to really, every time you get in front of a group, to talk about the 2020 census. That's really, really important. And um, I think we all need to, to kind of get collectively behind that. Mm-hmm. Berenice, one of the things that I think I shared with you as we were preparing for today's conversation was um, this, the, the, the deep admiration for the, the, the deep commitment and the organizational culture that um, to civic engagement that I think is authentic. One of the, in 2008, um, I had the privilege of working with a group of healthcare professionals across the country to register 30,000 voters in doctor's offices as part of an effort called Rx Democracy. Um, based on the same kind of principles that you outlined here. And what we found was um, Ultimate and your organization and many others who were kind of leaders in this space, it, it wasn't just a program, right? It was, it was a, um, there was a culture and there was a deep sense of mission. And the different prongs that you've just highlighted right now, it reflect that when you have a deeper kind of commitment, um, an organizational culture where um, a commitment to social determinants of health is deep, but also civic participation in particular, then you see all these different strategies come to life. So I just wanted to call that out and thank you for the call out also for the shout out for National Voter Registration Day. And it's also a, a baton pass over, Dave, to you because I know that um, you've thought deeply about the kinds of relationships and the cultures that are key here as well as, as organizations like yours are partnering to address structural determinants. That's right. And you know, I think um, what Berenice was saying is, is really well uh, articulated You know, in terms of how to take on this work. I, I want to acknowledge a little bit of the psychology of you know, moving from social needs to structural determinants, which is that it can, you know, frankly feel paralyzing um, or just overwhelming, you know, to uh, to grapple with income inequality or issues of racial justice, uh, you know, or even homelessness, given, given uh, you know, how many people it affects. Um, and so I, there are just three, you know, lessons from, from our work, uh, again, which is very much in progress, um, which I would share briefly. The first is to maintain a sense of scale. You know, and I, I really try to emphasize this in any conversation about social determinants because, um, you know, having an app that helps someone uh, locate a food pantry, while it may be a very worthy effort, has to be paired with the very real, you know, policy uh, challenges that we're facing, uh, for example, in terms of threats to SNAP, the food stamps program at the federal level. So understanding, you know, the sense of scale helps one to allocate um, their time and their uh, and their scarce resources. The second is to think about, um, there's a, a quote, a Gandhian quote um, that always comes to mind, which is turning the spotlight inward. Uh, and I think, you know, when something does feel paralyzing, uh, that's a way to think about how one can just get started. Uh, Ultimed's, you know, work is a really shining example of that. Another one that I would cite is, you know, for issues of racial justice, um, one way to start, which we are as a system, is to um, to take on implicit bias, you know, within the, the work and the services that we ourselves provide. Um, and then the third one, very briefly, just to say, is to make sure that in all of this work, there is a reflex to partner. You know, too often in healthcare, we feel like we have to solve everything ourselves. And I hope the overriding lesson, you know, from our medical legal partnership in particular is that, look, there are people who are more expert um, and in many cases at the community level are more trusted, you know, in communities than uh, than we may be. And so there should always be that reflex to partnership. Dave, thank you for that. And um, I think in the interest of time here right now, just based on where we're at, um, there's a lot of great kind of uh, questions that are coming through right now. And I'm wondering if um, we can show you first uh, the insights that come from that, that come from really everybody in this uh, in this space right now. I'm going to show you uh, briefly what uh, we're seeing here. Let me just show you guys very quickly what uh, uh, we're seeing. Oh, the word cloud is not working here. Let me see if I can get that up. Um, to show folks, but we're we're seeing a whole variety of um, different structural determinants of health. And since I can't show the word cloud because of my own technical incompetence, <laughs> then I will um, 
Uh, we'll just uh, voice over some of the things that all of you have kind of mentioned so far with housing being a primary structural term of health that um, I think many folks mentioned, but let me um, read off some of the other things that have come through. Access, um, uh, low wages, uh, violence, um, generational costs, employment, uh, unemployment, literacy, homelessness, voter engagement, economic quality, um, ACEs, banking systems. There's a whole variety, uh, the census as well. So there's a whole variety of things. And we'll, what we'll do in the report out from this when everybody gets a follow-up um, uh, email for today, we'll, we'll send out that word cloud to you guys, just reflecting the various structural harms that you've identified. And wondering if you could also um, take a moment and identify the kind of actions inspired by what you heard from our two presenters today, actions that you think are resources even uh, that could be helpful for healthcare institutions who are um, moving further along in trying to address, reduce, or prevent structural harms whether it's racial injustice, um, longstanding kind of uh, structural racism, um, or a variety of other structural causes that um, you've identified earlier. Go ahead and submit your short answers in the Q&A pane um, as, we, as we try to highlight some of the things we've learned, um, both in conversations today with our presenters, as well as in preparation for today, about five ways to tackle structural determinants of health. Uh, this touches on, I think, each of the elements that Berenice, you and Dave, you as well kind of spoke to. Um, it, First, you know, one of the ways to be able to do this is to start to understand the nuanced differences um, and the relationship between social needs, social determinants, and the structural determinants, the kind of individual, community, and societal um, differences there in terms of levels of change. And then to identify, and I think that each of you spoke to this, about the importance of being able to start with or identify a relationship with a non-clinical partner, especially one who has deep experience in addressing policies and structural determinants of health. These are the lawyers, the advocates, the community organizers, uh, public health partners, policymakers even. And I think each of you spoke to your experiences in doing that, and I'm sure many of you who've done the structural determinants work know how critically important it is to have those relationships, um, have them be authentic relationships, and then to identify concrete actions based on those relationships to address a, a structural determinant. There's a whole variety of actions um, from sharing, sharing not just your voice, but your data. Sometimes advocates in the community we see uh, need that quite a bit. And some of the, the uh, geospatial maps that Veronisa, you shared, give an example of that. Um, clearly, as you identify a concrete action to take, then how do you build internal relationships as well as the external ones to mobilize support internally to take that action? And then how do you, over time, I think for all of us, how do we update the upstream strategies we're all developing to make sure that they don't just include a focus on social needs or even social determinants, but also the structural determinants of health? Um, part of that actually um, is about um, learning what it means to activate your own staff, your own colleagues internally. One of the questions that came through, Berenice, was about, about exactly that. And, and I know we don't have too much time, but I'm wondering, Berenice and Dave, if you could speak to the, uh, who are the folks internally that, you've, that, that work with you to be able to move on the voter engagement or the public charge or medical legal partnership side? Can you just give us a quick round robin of you know, who, who are the staff that actually help with this? Because it's not just you guys. I, I can start if that's okay. This is um, Bernice. And so I, for us, um, so it's a combination. So we actually have a dedicated civic engagement team. It's a team of five that really, you know, keep the, this engine of civic engagement going on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think at a, at a high level, we have engaged our, our president and CEO in this work, our uh, chief operating officer, folks who handle the healthcare operations of all of our clinics, um, and also frontline staff. We do a lot of work with educating our frontline staff on how to, you know, develop talking points for them, et cetera, giving them deeper dives into regulations like public charge, but also how to, you know, respond to someone that is asking about an election that's coming up or any resources around that. Um, and in addition to that, we have an Institute of Health Equity here at Ultimed, um, and we we have a, a directed a team that is really helping us to examine our model of care mm -hmm. uh, that we provide and figuring out how we embed civic engagement within, to, within, the, within our model of care um, so that we can sustain it forevermore. Yeah. Thank you, Berenice. Dave, quick thoughts on your team. I know you have a whole team of social determinants focused leaders. We do. We have an amazing team that is, you know, thinking creatively about this. Um, I would echo what Berenice said about the importance of leadership support. And, you know, I think a big part of um, the role of anyone who is really passionate about this work is to have the courage of their convictions, you know, to bring it to the very top of an organization, because that's often where, um, where advocacy can really, you know, ignite um, in terms of other partnerships. And the other quick thought I would share is, you know, again, putting on my, my doctor hat, um, 
you know, we're more and more asked to work in teams in the clinical setting. And one thing that I think a lot about is how we can better forge um, partnership in that team-based way for policy change and advocacy. So nurses, social workers, pharmacists, doctors, everyone, you know, working together for the things that are really affecting our patients' health. Dave, where you and Berenice just ended is where we'll probably wrap it today. And, and you, you spoke to the importance of team and expanding the notion of team. Certainly that's important, as you see in the second bullet point here, which is that we know health is created with others. It's not consumed or a commodity necessarily. It's a, it's a resource that's continuously created with others. And just as it's created with others, uh, we can together dismantle systems that cause suffering. Um, there's a, um, quite a bit of um, uh, expertise and wisdom that was shared both in the call today and I think each of you who's dialed in today share one of the ways that we've tried to um, bring this back um, home to what to a framework that Dave introduced was to speak about the fact that that arc uh, that bends towards social justice, as Dave kind of paraphrased from Martin Luther King, uh, who himself par paraphrased it from a 19th century abolitionist. You know, we, we know that this frame is powerful, but we also know that that arc doesn't bend on its own. And by moving upstream, our belief, um, and I don't think we're alone in this, is that we can help bend that arc towards social justice. Social needs, social determinants, and structural determinants are a way of moving that arc towards justice. Um, with that, um, keep your um, your email eyes peeled for a follow-up survey. Share your insights with us. Continue to, to stay engaged. Certainly take action on and based on inspiration you've had today. And continue to stay engaged about how to move upstream. Follow us. Follow uh, Dave Choksi um, and uh, Berenice and Eunice Constant. My thanks to both of them and to each of you for dialing in today. Um, this has uh, hopefully been a webinar that's not only about education and a little bit of inspiration, but a whole lot of provocation about how to um, collectively bend that arc towards justice. Uh, thank you all. We'll to, uh, talk to you again on the next webinar, um, and thank you for joining us today.